So, Ruth Tapping, um, you're a gilder. Well, what does a gilder do? What's gilding? Gilding is the application of gold leaf, um, which is really thin hammered gold. And is that real gold? That is genuine gold. That is wow. 23.75 carats, so nearly pure. Gosh. And it's really thin. So you have to keep all the windows closed. In that really hot weather we had, I couldn't have a fan on. Goodness me. Couldn't have anything on because my gold would go everywhere. So I'm, um, there you go. Can't Gosh, that about really it. is thin Seriously stuff, thin. isn't it? So I'm water gilding these top edges and bottom edges that are red. Um, okay. You have a mix of oil gilding here, which is quite a matte gold. And then water gilding is one you can burnish. And burnishing, you have an agate stone, and you and you can. What's an agate stone? It's just a um, like a semi-precious. So, so it's very smooth, almost yeah, like yeah. a gemstone. Just, just yeah, and it's just shaped. Okay. So okay. Um, shaped into different shapes. So I've got one for doing more pointy stuff one for getting into into places so there's all sorts of um, okay. and yeah so once once the gilding's dry you, you you burnish it with that but you can't do that with the oil gilding because it's a different technique so burnishing just makes the gold shiny as we think what you, oh, yes and what like you're actually leaf. burnishing is this this is a clay based paint so this is bowl and because it's got clay in it you can burnish it and that's what's shining through the gold to make it shiny I see. Like so, on the mirror behind you there, you've got a contrast, it, there's some burnished on there. So so it's that colour for a reason because that works well with the gold leaf. This is this colour because it's French and so, if it was English I'd have a pink. I know it looks, but it's a much, it's like a salmon pink and then you have a black on the top. Okay. Um, and that would, that's our English Victorian colours. If you go further back into Regency and Georgian, it, it was um, an orangey, orangey purple. Wasn't some of it black at one point? After yeah, the, the, the Victorian yeah, yeah, yeah. story. Yeah. Um, most Victorian stuff is got the got the black on, and it's possibly due to that. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Right. Okay. I just try and work out how big a sheet to do. I'm going to try for half a sheet. So, I take my gilding lacquer, which is water little bit of rabbit skin glue and a bit of mess. So I need to wet where I'm going to gild and it evaporates fairly quickly. That's because of the mess in it, yeah. is it? Yeah. Okay. But I don't want it to stay wet too long. So hopefully I'm oily enough. Right, so what you've just done there, you've taken some, literally some oil from your skin. Yeah, if I'm too clean wow. I can't do it. <laughs> And and, and that, that brush was is that's a special kind of brush I assume. It's a it's called a gilder's tip. Um I think it's badger hair or squirrel hair. Badger hair I think. Um and it, you just need that length to be able to pick up, I pick see. up the go. It really so, is delicate, isn't it? Yeah, I don't usually talk when I'm gilding, so um Oh crack, it sticks to everything. So each one of those sheets is separated by a piece of tissue or some kind of separator yeah and so this this book which has got 25 sheets in is about 25 pounds wow. so it's about a pound a sheet goodness me so how many sheets would you use typically on the edge of this this box um i probably wouldn't be using a book so less okay. than a book not and doing well how how long have you been gilding ruth and how did you get into it you know what and how long have you been doing it? 17 years ago I finished my uh, fine art degree in sculpture and I joined a, um, a mirror workshop here in Leek. I knew nothing about gilding and restoring. Um, so I learnt everything. I, well, I learnt quite a lot there. But when the owner moved to France... Sorry, I need some cotton wool. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. So when the owner moved to France, um, he closed the business. I'd been there five years. I was like, let's do this on my own. Okay. So you set up your own gilding operation. 
I was very fortunate to be offered um, a job in a stately home. They gave me a little cottage on the estate. Wow. I spent nine months there doing all the interior gilding, all their antiques, everything. And it gave me enough photographs to start a website. I to, see. To, to then launch my business. Um, and literally from that one job, it's just snowballed. Um, so, so we're 17 years later. And then so presumably by now, um, in those 17 years, it's fair to say that your restored pieces, the gilding that you've done, graces the rooms of some fine establishments around the country and indeed around the world. Yes, around the world. Uh, there's some out in the Middle East, there's some in the Caribbean. Um, uh, some of the res restoration, there's, um, if you go into the entrance hall in Claridge's, one of my restored mirrors Claridge's is there. in yeah, London, yeah, wow. Yeah. So, so your work really is seen both far and wide and by, um, by the rich and famous who, who frequent those places. It certainly is. Uh, a lot of it's private homes. Um, yeah. A lot of it. It's lovely when somebody comes in and says, this was grandma's. When I was five, I remember it on the wall. It's, yeah, uh, it's, it, I've inherited it. It's fallen off the wall. It's broken. I'm absolutely devastated. Can you restore it? And usually I can. And how often does that kind of thing happen where people, I know, but maybe, you know, it, it could be that it's something that's been in the family for years or in the home for years, or even sometimes I, I expect where an elderly relative has passed away and they've gone into the property and, and, and discovered um, various pieces. A lot of the pieces I get are inherited. Um, also inherited then fall off the wall. Now they don't, it's been on grandma's wall for 50 years. Yes. They, they take it off, they bring it home, they put it on the wall. They don't think about the fact that it was just string. Now it's, it's been moved and changed yes. and you've rehung, you've put some pressure on it. And then a month later it's on the floor. Yeah always happens and uh, nobody ever thinks to hang a mirror with either screws in a wall or wire or a chain it's always string okay and which, these are, which keeps me in work <laughs> but these are pretty heavy pieces as yeah. well uh, yeah. it, it's the majority of your work with mirrors or can it be anything from a mirror to a box like you're working on now basically anything that's gilded or anything that can be gilded okay. um, i like working on the mirrors um more than the picture frames because a picture frame is fairly straightforward and simple if a corner's missing, you've got another corner to mould. Yes, of course. On a mirror, if you've got a side scroll missing, this side scroll's the opposite. So you can't mould it, you have to sculpt that up. So my sculpting skills come in handy right. and, you know, I enjoy it. So what do you sculpt in for to, to make the, the match? Yeah. So if it's a big piece, I will um, draw, it, draw it out, flip it over, draw it out again, and make it in clay on the piece. W uh, uh, with some cling film so it doesn't damage the frame. Mould that, take the mould off, take the clay off and then press the composition which the other scroll would have been made of originally into that mould and then attach attach that. Okay, tell me, I'm, I'm intrigued, I've heard this term composition before or I've even heard you refer to it as compo. Compo, yeah. W what is composition or compo and why is it so pivotal to, to, to mirrors particularly? So, years and years ago um, everything was wood carved and it was expensive to have things wood carved and some bright spark invented putting animal glue, tree resin, white in, loads of other stuff together in a pot, stir it all up and you get this um, like a bread dough. Okay. So you warm it up and you press it into moulds and there's actually a lot of glue in it so it will stick itself to a frame. Now that absolutely revolutionised frame making because it's quick, it's a mould, you don't have to pay the carver. I see. You may have to originally pay the carver to do a boxwood mould, reverse carve it, because it doesn't have silicon in those days. But then you can but reproduce you it. it once. Yeah, yes. and you can re reproduce that a thousand times. So it just brought down, and then the mirrors sort of became not just in stately homes, the middle classes could afford it, and you know now anybody can afford it. So yeah, the okay. compo was actually quite important really. Um, okay. So you still use those methods that were the, developed? The recipe that was, I've got, it, it would have been used 150, 200 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, same recipe, same, same products. In fact, the one thing I can't do is put modern products with this. All these layers are all animal glue or rabbit skin glue based. And if you start to put a resin in there, it, it detaches, it doesn't like it. So if you're gessoing on top of like car body filler, if somebody's repaired something with car body filler, it doesn't like it, so in about a year's time it'll it'll peel off. So it really is important that in in, in modern times yeah. you, you maintain 
the that traditional, fidelity yeah, to the, the traditional, have traditional methods and materials. Might I mean, not be the kind I use, of I use a microwave to heat my bowl up yeah. and my gesso up and because yeah. everything needs heating. I don't have a Bain Marie, but if they had a microwave they would have yeah. you know, I'm not that Puritan but <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's another term you've used there with gesso. gesso. I've heard you say that before. What's gesso and, and how's it used? So you start with a wooden frame and gesso is basically just chalk and rabbit skin glue and you, you paint it on layer after layer after layer. You usually have about 12 layers of gesso. That um, then gives you a base, to st that's the white base that you then start to put your bowl or your decoration on. So you're basically just getting rid of the wood grain and giving a perfect finish. Right, so it's, it's what we might think of as an undercoat. Yeah. Yeah, lots and lots of undercoats that have to be sanded, perfectly right. flat, flat and smooth. So there's an awful lot of sanding in my So it isn't just a piece of gesso that, sorry, a, a, an application of gesso. It might be one application, then a sanding, then another gesso, then a sanding and so well, on. Well, I normally do um, about 10 coats of gesso, um, wow. let it all build up and then do um, a, a, quite a rough sanding. If I need a couple more layers and then do, do, then do the fine sanding. Um, so yeah, some people do sand between layers, but I don't really see, I don't see the point. And, and like to build up a decent thickness and then and then sand it back. I see. So it's it's a very lengthy process. I mean, do you have to leave them overnight or for a few days in between various stages? In winter, it can take. You can probably do two coats a day. In summer, you could probably put nine, ten coats on. So it's all temperature. So, so atmospheric um, conditions really do impact on how quickly you can complete a job. A lot of what job. I have to do is, is waiting for things to dry. Um, and a lot of that depends on time of year, whether how warm my workshop is. You know, so having a nice workshop that's warm mm. is, um, is very beneficial. And, and I'm just seeing how delicate that gold is there. Um, I'm assuming or hoping that you don't suffer from hay fever. <laughs> I've got to learn to breathe through my ears. I can't, I can't laugh. Yeah, that would be yes, that would be devastating, wouldn't it? If you were sneezing and all your gold's going everywhere. Each sneeze, that's another one yeah, pound. Yeah, 50. another pound gone. Yeah, yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> so, so this this box you're doing here, this is this is made of this is a wooden box. Yes, pine pine box. And um, then how old's this piece roughly? Do you know? I don't know. I think it's. It, it's not too old, it's probably turn of the century, Okay. French. Um, it's a music box, I so see. all the music stuff's in there and I think it has a bird cage that sits on top and then you play the music and the bird moves. And now that, that, that strikes me, um, so turn of the century, so, be so beginning of the 1900s, Yeah. that century. Yeah. Um, it strikes me as being in pretty good condition, I, I expect that some other things, especially mirrors, when they've fallen off the wall of, as you've described, um, by the time they've fallen off the wall, people bring you things that are in a, ba a bag of bits. Oh, I often get a bag of There's a bag of bits over there, yeah. Bag of bits. I love bag of bits. You love bags of bits? I love bags of bits. Is that the best bit about your job? One of the best bits about my job, somebody comes in and they're devastated that this yeah. has fallen off the wall. Usually they're devastated. Um, and the, and the, there's the bag of bits. I don't know if they're all there, you know. There's, there's the, literally the sweepings off the floor, the dog hair and everything in it. So you have a puzzle to put to get back together. Yeah, I love like puzzles, so, um, and often they don't have a photograph, so I can just... I see, right. But 17 years of experience, if it's a certain type of mirror, I roughly know what the top... It's usually the top or the bottom decoration that's, that's come off, you know, it's off the frame, so it's delicate, it smashes. So you can, yeah, you're literally piecing it all together. There's always bits missing, so you've got bits to sculpt in as well, and the look on the face when they get it back, and they, they literally can't believe that you've, you know, they can't tell it's been done. And would you make it look as though it looked the, the, the same way it looked when it very first came out of the workshop in 1850, or do you then try and age it, or do you then age it so that well, one can see that it's, it's not just come out of a workshop? If, um, if the customer wants it bright, I'll leave it bright, but it's not really our tastes in Britain. We like to see the age of the gold. I see. So if I'm just repairing a little bit, obviously this brand new piece of gold needs toning down to match the other piece of gilding. I now, see. I haven't got a universal way of toning that one piece of gilding because that mirror might have been in a smoky environment, another mirror might have been in a, a more damp environment. You know, there's 
it's had its own history. Yes, of so course. So when it comes to me, I can line up five mirrors and not one of the golds will look the same. So I've now got to put new gold onto that or over the repairs and I've got to go, oh, how do I age this to match that mirror? Then I go to this one. Oh, it's going to have to be slightly different for this one. So there's a lot of skill in trying to get this. I was this. going to say, I guess that's something that you, you've, you've learned, you know, that, that judgment call it over was the years. It was something I was really unsure of. I didn't, I didn't really have a lot of confidence in it, but I've learned. I've learned how to do yeah. it. So, you know, I've, do, I've done it for 17 years now. So it's, it, it's almost second nature, which is... It's good. I don't have that anxiety about it anymore. And 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 I suppose, given the um, the number of mirrors that I'm seeing in, in the workshop, that you you you're rather busy. I'm assuming from that that there aren't many Ruth tappings around. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. There are guilders in London, um, but in the north, no, there aren't that there aren't that many people doing what I'm doing. And yeah, I've got a six month waiting list, which is you know it's great for me. Um, the demand's there, so and, and it's um, it's a lovely craft. I think a lot of people like the idea of gilding, but they don't really realise the amount of prep work. I probably gild only 10-20% of my job. The rest of my job is preparing the surface for I gilding. See. So what we're really seeing now is the is the the most exciting bit, really. The sort of you know the bit that what, everybody what wants to yeah, do. Yeah, the bit yeah. that everybody wants to do. Yeah, the actual gilding. Yeah, because it, it's it's gold. You know. It's, yes. You yes. Know, of people, course. People want to want to play with gold, um, and nobody can believe just how, how thin this gold is. Hmm. So what happened? I mean, it looks there, Ruth, like you you literally you're carving the the, the leaves up into you know just the right sort of sizes and, and pieces do you have any waste if so because gold as we know is a, a an expensive it's a precious metal do you have any waste if so can you recycle that gold do you i have a um if you oil gild you, you do get your bench sort of covered in loose bits of gold little tiny bits of gold so i um hoover it up with a bit of muslin on the end of my hoover and i keep a little pot and one day I'll take it to um, somewhere that can melt it down. Okay. And once I have enough of that, they can melt it down and give me some money, which would be great. Which you can then buy more gold with yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and so on and so forth. But there isn't, there isn't an awful lot. I, I, I haven't actually yet done that. So I've been doing it for this many years and I haven't yet got right, around okay. to doing it. So I'm, you don't want to waste it. No. You know, you, you're paying for it. So or, or And when, when you were a beginner, I mean, you, you mentioned it is a, you know, it's a wonderful craft. How accessible is it to... The, the, the hobbyist at home to, to start doing something like this and if they were to start doing it what kind of thing would you recommend a beginner to start with you know because the um, mirrors you do obviously are quite complex yeah yeah um, and very valuable as well I'd start with a picture frame a picture frame um, get something fairly cheap um, you, can, you can buy all these from um, all this equipment from supply shops there are lots of gilding courses Around the country, you can always find a gilding course. Um, it's the restoration part that that really nobody teaches. But if you just want to do gilding, you can either go on a course. Or there's so many YouTube videos. Um, Your own included in that, of course. Yes, yes. But you can't. Um, I, I was very lucky that I learnt on the job. I didn't have to pay for the gold. Yes. So I was screaming at the gold for three months. I hate. I absolutely hated it couldn't control it, I didn't know how to breathe around it, I couldn't lay it properly without it splitting. You always lay and, and, and split the gold, it's just part of the job, but every sheet was being split. I see. Then after about three months it was like, I think I've got this. Okay. Um, but that was doing it every day, that yeah. was your living, you know, yeah, for yeah. eight hours a day. Yeah. But someone else was paying for the gold. Yes, okay. It was a good start. Yeah. It was a good so, start. Um, so that, that, was, that was really good. Yeah. And, and what do you enjoy doing most? Is it, would it be um, boxes like this? Would it be the mirrors? I noticed you've got... Um, what, 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 do you, what do you call these things here, for example? What, what are these? The wall brackets. These are wall brackets. So they'll, yeah, sit on a wall. Okay. If you, you can see that. Sit on a wall and you have a vase. I see. Sat on top. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're really sweet. Um, I think mirrors are my, are my favourite. I did have a harp once. I did. I did enjoy gilding the harp. Wow! That was just because it's an impressive, an impressive piece. Um, 
but actually I have what I call a Sunday job. 